How y'all doing? We are in extraordinary times. Yes? Okay. You are not in the world in this time by a mistake. You have not tread the crazy road you've walked to get you to this place by accident. The experiences, the traumas, the victories, all of that is being brought together for such a time. You're in this. And it's good. Okay. You ready? Say yes. 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 <laughs> I keep waiting for somebody to go, no. We have a lot going on right now. By the way, today is Levi's 28th birthday. <laughs> but what you really need to applaud is Kim because she put 31 hours of back labor. And me, I had the burden of coaching. Come on. Ten minutes past ten on the tenth month of the tenth day of the tenth month. He came out. And uh, we, we have been in recovery ever since. Mm -hmm. So, um, doubtless, as you drove down our street, right, it's just um, you see the tale about when the storm hit. This is just a clip off one of the website. It looks like hell. Hurricane Helene leaves Georgia community in ruins as families brace for long power outages. And uh, interview with somebody there in Valdosta, Georgia. So, um, yeah, for us, that meant right here, 11 days without grid electric. Okay. Came on 830 on Monday night. Um I had sort of braced for this, and so um, that's our garage circuit box. Uh, it's, that's one of three, actually. There's two more around. But flipped off the breakers of non-essentials, and then I had the generator. I set it up to be hardwired into the house panel. And so you have to constantly watch it, adjust the power distribution when it's going, lots and lots of fuels. How many were running generators? Okay. Back and forth all the time. It was a daily trip. At first, it was pretty stressful because you weren't sure what kind of lines and bozos were in the, excuse me, other people were in the line. Some of them just taking their very sweet time. <laughs> if you've been waiting 45 minutes anyway, but that got better. Now, one of the things I learned from the last time is last time we had this set up and we didn't know when the power was coming back on. So we had to keep in close contact with a neighbor because you have to make sure that the main breaker is, is off because you can't be feeding electricity up in that or have it come on. So in the interim of the last time we had this and this time I found this little $25 item on Amazon and you set it up and it curls around. There's an antenna that senses the current and then you turn it on and when the current comes back on from the main grid, it lights up an alarm. So that went off, and that grid was restored to the house junction, and that was well and good, but that wasn't enough. Now you got to do some other things. The alarm goes off. You have to shut down, disconnect the generator. I've got a dedicated circuit breaker there, so I make sure it was disconnected. Then you got to flip the switch, and this one is a big monster switch there, and when you go to do it, it basically takes two hands. It's a very serious switch. It kind of, when you push on it, it's kind of like saying, do you really mean this? Because when you do that, you are connecting to the grid, okay? And there's a tremendous amount of power that can come through there. And so then I could go through the house and flip all the breakers on the non-essential stuff um, back on. And one of the things that, that got to do then was we got hot showers. How many of you got to appreciate the little things a lot during this time, right? I, I spent a lot of time, Lord, thank you for the generator. Thank you that we have water. Because before we had a generator, because we're on well, we wouldn't have water either. And that really is kind of, that makes it increasingly difficult. So all of that happened, and it, it but, but the whole thing with the, the flipping it back happened just before I was going to go on a statewide prayer call. And some of you might have been on that. So the Lord was downloading some prophetic things for me about it. So let me 
connect this with the body of Christ and with the church. Eleven days, eleven is a number in Scripture that's of chaos and transitions, of change, of challenge, of trials, okay? Clearly that's it. Many a church will go through that, right? The problem is, is they get in going without grid power. Often through a crisis, people begin to disconnect from the real power of God, and they start to learn how to flip the breaker, so they're really, uh, no non-essentials are going to operate. We're just going to kind of simplify it down. Yeah, we had this, we had that, we had signs, wonders, other things, but now we're just going to keep showing up. We're going to keep the lights on. They move into a generator or self-power, and they get it kind of hardwired into the body. Some of you have experienced this, yes? Hello. <laughs> There's constant watching over that fuel source. They have to adjust where the power goes because there's, frankly, just not enough. There's not enough people, not enough resources, not enough time. And so they're busy trying to plug in around, and everyone who shows up, it's great. How can you fit here into our agenda? Hello? Yeah, it's just how it works. There's lots and lots of fuel, time, and focus all to just keep it going. Is there a power alert in place? When God shows up and says, I want to engage you again full throttle, there's usually not. <laughs> there might be one poor soul in the back going, hey, God is here and he really wants to shift things. And they're like, oh, shut up. Just sit down. You can't do that here. And God is restoring the power to the house junction, but we often prefer the gift to the grid. It's one of the things the Lord spoke to me. We were so grateful for the gift of the generator. But if you keep focusing on the gift, you forget the grid. And a church often will stay on the generator, self-effort, control, concerns with no authentic power, and they don't know or don't really want to flip the switch back. Because frankly, it's loud and it's dangerous, and you never know with that much power going through the place what might happen. You tracking? Okay. So... Let's run it this way personally. Okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's all true about maybe them. How about you? When you go through the storms, when there's been 11 days and some kind of darkness, spiritual darkness, emotional darkness, chaos and transition, and you just feel like you've gotten cut off from the grid. Any of you had that experience? Okay. And it's like something in you, you're cutting off all the non-essentials because you're just trying to survive. Hello? You just kind of try to get through, and so you're constantly sort of trying to monitor and discipline yourself and get hardwired into that, and you're constantly having to watch where your energy is because there's just not much left. Adjusting where the power goes, there's lots and lots of attention to just trying to stay fueled, and most of us don't have a power alert in place when God breaks through and says, Hey! Because we're so busy just trying to survive. No? Anybody? And while he may restore it to the house junction somehow, sometimes we just prefer to be in that mode, right? I can be a lot that way. I, because of the environment in which I was raised, just felt unsafe. So I kind of had to figure, well, if it's to be, it's up to me. And as a believer, you can form into a kind of pragmatic atheism. Oh, yeah, I believe God. I love God and everything else. But if this has to get done, I need to do it. Nobody here has that. Okay, maybe one. And sometimes then I can prefer the gift, my own physical strength, my own resources, my own sense of self-discipline and focus and take control and charge. If you've known me, you, you can see that part around me. I can, I can do that, okay? But the challenge is sometimes then I'm preferring the gift that he's given me and the capabilities and resources to the grid because plugging into the grid feels dangerous. That, that, that throw switch. Make sense? You guys copy? It was just something the guy was kind of like speaking to me and all of that going, okay, pay attention here because this is a message for the body, but it's a message for you too, Stephen. So the question is, how do you plug into the grid when the grid looks like that? <laughs> how many would you be willing to climb up on that and plug into that grid? Why not? Ah, come on, live a little, die soon. Yeah. 
there has to be an interface, right? There's got to be a step, a connection that allows power to flow, but without killing me. <laughs> now, you understand from God's grid and the power there that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, right? You know that. But again, the question of when you're going from this much power through that kind of relay system and it needs to get here, the question is, how does that actually happen safely? How do I approach? How do I do it? And it really comes back to this, folks. There's power in the blood. Say, there's power in the blood. Do you know this really is not a very popular word in a good part of the body of Christ? The blood just kind of freaks people out. You're around it a bit more, but not as much as you need to be. So let me just run through some scriptures for you. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Say, the life is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. You get that. It's purifying blood. Everything under the law was purified with blood since forgiveness only comes through an outpouring of blood. Redemption in the blood. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Justification. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him. Relocation. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you ever think about that? You are far removed and without hope. You are an alien and stranger and even an enemy to the covenant promises. That was your trajectory. But by the blood. There's a process of the blood. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah, you know these scriptures. You know this one well. War by the blood. The accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. We, it, the blood purifies, it redeems, it justifies, it draws us near. There's a constant cleansing. It's a means of war, and it's the basis of our victory. In other words, folks, we must be bloody. And that fits really interesting. <laughs> because in the question of when are we in time, we've come through the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Terah, the head of the year, the start of a new year. We are now in the days of awe and moving right quickly into atonement, Yom Kippur. The one day when the priests would go, the high priest would go behind the veil. The relationship sustained by blood. That will lead into a party planning, then into tabernacles, Sakat, party hardy. Remember, you're still on the move and dwell because God's glory is with us. So we are right here. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, is when? Thank you. Saturday starts sundown on Friday night on Shabbat. And it's an annual progression God has to try to draw us closer. And many of you have seen this illustration. It was uh, drawn from um, Robert Heidler out of Glory of Zion. It's very helpful for me. If you look at the tabernacle of Moses and how it is set up, there is an outer courtyard that has an altar and sacrifice and fire. Then there's the lather, which is cleansing and water. Then the inner court, you have the seven like lampstand, the showbread, and then you have the incense. And then there's this intense, thick veil. And when you go through it, there is the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. And so the progression is those first two are covered really in Passover. The cleansing of sins, the baptism through it, Pentecost is about provision, the abundance about the sevenfold spirit, of the living God reflected in the seven light lampstand. Tabernacles is about going into the deep intimacy of the mercy seat. 
The blood is required at the beginning. The blood is required at the back. And every year we're supposed to make this progression through because it's about salvation and baptism, then about being saturated with the Spirit and finally moving into deep intimacy. And there's a level of glory there. I always love this time of year. I'm sorry. It's just other people may have a favorite. This is this is my, the fall feasts are just my favorites because it's about getting behind the veil into that level of intimacy. And I'm a mercy wiring. If you don't know what wirings are, you need to talk with us. We can hook you up with Ruthie Young's teaching. Very helpful. Mercy's long for that place of intimacy with Father. Okay. So we want to constantly abide back there and get there. But there is this huge thing right there, this, this boundary, this barrier, this veil that stands there, and it's there for a reason, right? Absolutely for a reason, because it's keeping a barrier there so that we understand things and we're protected. It is a danger zone. I'm going to read some scriptures to you from Leviticus. When Nabat, Dab, and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire on it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Pretty intense, huh? What's very interesting, if you go through and you put um, a search in Scripture for those two names, you will find them mentioned three other times beforehand. They were brought into great intimacy with the Lord. They were counted among the 70 when the spirit of prophecy went out that actually sat and, and ate and drank with the Lord. They were named about Aaron's first sons as far as the special garments being made. God had mentioned them. This is not like they were out there being, you know, some bad boys off and never being around it. They were on the innermost, but they went presumptively before the presence of God. And you're trying to imagine Aaron dealing with this, right? His first and second born sons. Not latter, first and second. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. If you remember that Aaron doesn't get to cross, right? Nor does Moses. And God said, because you did not rightly honor me before Israel. Okay? This is a time when we just have to reset about the righteous fear of the Lord. Not being afraid of him, but having the right fear and understanding. And so in Leviticus 17, then the Lord begins to instruct Moses and through Moses to Aaron. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So you're Aaron. Imagine your thoughts. <laughs> you want me to go where? Do what? And so God begins to give him some directions. He's to put off his normal clothes, the high priestly office ones with the, the breastplate and all, to wash and then put on just plain linen garments. And then he's to take a bull and kill it. And the instructions pick up again. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die. I'm sorry, if you're Aaron and you're hearing this, and by the way, you, you need to make sure there's this big cloud of incense going on in there. Because if you don't, you will die. You have to get going behind the veil always has risks. I'm just trying to tell you. Those of you who've been married or not and become intimate, let me tell you, there are risks, yes or no? Because you are vulnerable and you are exposed. Just the way it is, folks. It's the cost of intimacy. 
He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his fingers seven times. Now, all this Aaron is doing just to cleanse the taint of sin from Aaron and his family. Now, he's going to do more, and he's going to do it with the goats for all of Israel. And it just cracks me up that Aaron actually has the bigger animal than all of Israel. Because anyone who's in leadership knows you need more work than anybody else. <laughs> okay? You, have, you need more work. Lord continues, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. You see, when the enemy decided to break off the church's understanding of the feasts, he, they, he really couldn't do that much with Passover because you have the crucifixion and resurrection. And Pentecost, he, he kind of blurred it out, but now you got the, the Holy Spirit falling. But with tabernacles and everything, it pretty much just... And what we have left is what? A Thanksgiving feast. That's the closest thing we come to it. We completely ignore the blood. And so we live very presumptively in terms of our relationship. Yes, we're saved by the blood, but as you just saw, there's a whole lot more in terms of operational. But just as far as us right now and what Aaron, I, I love these things. First, he had to wear a simple white garment. No pretense, no posing, no fluff, no BS. No, don't come with me in all your fanciness. Just come bare. But what's interesting, and I didn't have a great way to do this to splatter it all with blood, but that garment would have shown the blood of the bull and of the goats just So it starts out clean and white, but the only way he gets in there is he's covered with blood. And then that screen of incense is just amazing. It honors the otherness of God, right? And it also guards his life. You see, when God brings us back, there's always this twofold thing in terms of what he sees and what we see. And there is a protection that goes on there. He has to see the blood as Aaron crosses over. But Aaron can't see him. That's why the incense. Do you understand? And the blood that is there to cleanse all defilement and to maintain the relationship. But then you know there is more because there are two goats. When he's made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, you shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. I've told you before, I kind of wonder how long Aaron's got his hands on the head. And, okay, and remember Martha and this and that. You know, I don't know how particular. Try to get, excuse me. Could have been a while. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. How would you like to be that goat? Now, some would say, well, that, it's just a symbol. It doesn't mean anything. I, you release all that sin and impart it on there. Okay, we understand there's something tangible that happened. I, I don't know. I think there was an added grace to that goat because I think otherwise his legs would have just buckled. There's traditions that say they would tie a scarlet thread around the goat's neck, lest it by some chance come wandering back into the camp. <laughs> Another tradition is that they would instruct the guy taking the goat out there to take it to a high place and push it off. because They didn't want it wandering back, and they wanted it dead. But it was so serious that when the guy who let him out came back, he had to take off his clothes, burn them outside the camp, and wash, and then could come back in. And so we've seen this before. It's one day and two goats. One gets to live, one to die. 
One carries the sin. One cleanses the sin. One has a life he's got to endure. One is a life poured out. One is separated forever from community. The other is forever present by his blood to the King of Kings. And Jesus obviously is shown in both. But I think this is powerful. They also can represent our choice. Some people kind of have that attitude and choose to live outside community. And you know what? They're just wandering around and pretty much burying all that sin. Hello? No? Any of you go through a stage like that? Okay. Sometimes we just feel driven out from community. Or this one, to die and enter into the presence. Because there is no entering fully into the presence without dying. Do you get that? Something's got to go. So, coming up Saturday, significance of the Day of Atonement for you, or sometimes, and Mike pointed this out last year, atonement can also be spelled at one mint, right? It's about connecting. One, that God still dwells with his people, yes or no? He wants us to come behind the veil, yes or no? Okay, as you're saying this, then you, you, you understand. That he is holy, other, not common, worthy of righteous fear. Yes or no? That he still takes sin seriously because it taints, corrupts, distorts, kills. It's, there's so much grace, but it's, but it's connected to truth and what we have to deal with. That the blood must be applied to maintain right relationship on a regular basis. Writers of Hebrews says, We do not have a high priest who can not sympathize with our weakness, but he was in all ways tempted as we are without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, right? In behind, in the intimate place, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So here's my question. If what I'm saying is true, if the blood is the connector to the power in the grid, how do you walk in consistent relationship to the blood? Do you? Yay or nay? I'm serious, because this is something that was not for me, okay, until I began to learn more and more about the power of it, and I began to incorporate parts. You know, I have quite an extensive prayer that I walk through with the Lord. It's a conversation, things that I declare. So I'm just going to lift out some parts of that. When I'm talking to the Father, I get to the part where I say this, thank you for including me in Christ, that when you look at me, you see his blood right now, and you've forgiven me my sin. You see, the blood is for God to look upon so that I am seen through that, right? And so this is part of what I declare, declare about that. And it's so interesting. I sit there, you know, my, my seat to pray and, and, and worship is looking out over the street there. And, but I just, yeah, Lord, I just thank you for including me in Christ, that when you look at me right now, you see his blood. You have forgiven me my sin. You've exchanged my life for his and his for mine, granting me his righteousness. You have grafted, and I go on and on and on. And it's not just to say it. It's, it's real. It's genuine. Later on when I'm talking to Jesus, this is one of the phrases that I have there. It is by your stripes alone that I am forgiven am healed, and that I am cleansed from all unrighteousness and renewed and restored into right relationship with the Father. That part there, that I am renewed and restored in right relationship to the Father, is critical. I, I am very keenly aware of that, folks. Without the blood, right, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I'm not, how many of you shower daily? Everybody but Tim. Okay. That's because Tim showers three times a day because Nan knows he needs it. Thank you, Nan. We are all grateful for that. How often do you spiritually shower? You don't need to sit there and be constantly doing that in the spirit, okay? I don't need to do this constantly physically because I shower every day, right? 
But if I know I get certain activities, I might need to check. I might need another shower. I might want another shower. Okay, it's the same way spiritually. I don't have to be paranoid going through the day about how I'm doing because I've gotten it cleaned up in the morning, folks. And if you don't have this as part of your process, let me challenge you. I remember walking with a guy for a while who was highly prophetic, honored as a prophet. And we got into this conversation about repentance. And he said, well, I just never worry about that. I figure if there's something wrong, Jesus will tell me. Okay. Well, that's assuming that you're going to be willing to hear it. And if there's something that wrong, you probably aren't. So he may be trying to tell you, you aren't listening. And this guy fell into all sorts of stuff. And it's just, ah, okay. Later on, when I'm talking with him, I say, thank you, Lord, for the price that you paid and what you endured and suffered for my sake. And then I go through because I remember it before him. I said, Lord, about that time in the garden and the agony that you felt, knowing what you were going to be walking into, that you were betrayed and abandoned, led in the dark of night, that unjust trial, falsely accused, the death sentence laid upon you. And I go through it, and I remember, and I think about, and you were beaten, and you were whipped, and your skin was stripped from your body, spat upon and hated and cursed. And the thorns were pounded down on your skull. And I, I go because I'm bringing this to mind because the blood is in all of that. And it's so important. And otherwise, I get so removed and abstract. I really probably would not do well as a farmer having to butcher the pork and then cook it. I like my pork laid out in the meat cabinet, right, behind nice, clean saran wrap. So I'm not one that needs to go into the gore, but I know when value has been given. And I, years ago, I had a roommate, Mark Pallas, and he was saved as an adult at like 21, 23. And every time we would pray, he would begin with, Jesus, thank you so much for saving me. He had a passion of, of gratitude that always just, I was all but jealous of it. I, I wanted that, but I'd been around it so long. Hello? I mean, I'd been saved since quite young, and so it was just I didn't have that same fire. I have that fire now because daily I'm bringing a remembrance of what he paid, what he endured, and I'm laying hold of the full benefit of it. I don't want God to have given me something that Jesus suffered for and not make use of it. That just feels like, that's like if you really worked hard to make something and everything, you present it to somebody and they go, oh, thanks. No? Okay. And it connects in with this part of Hebrews 9. Paul is warning about the danger. And he says, remember, do not count the blood of the covenant a common thing and insult the spirit of grace. This is that part where it says about people who have trampled underfoot the sacrifice of Jesus. Yeah, we good? Okay. So I want to connect it with this one thing. The work of Jesus in Isaiah, it says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Part of what Jesus is recognized for in his labor is making intercession, right? Blood is the means by which that intercession can be made. And the work of Jesus continues, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, rather, that is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. I love this part. I, I include this part. Lord, I thank you that you sit now at the right hand of the Father, and you live daily to make intercession for me, your people, and your kingdom. And he entered that by the blood. It's again, it's by the blood. The blood connects you into the grid. 
this reminder out of Hebrews 7, therefore he, Jesus, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Are you aware that Jesus prayed for you today? Did you walk accordingly? That just blows my mind. I'm sorry. It would have been real helpful to know this early in my my walk with the Lord that he was that committed. <laughs> so, getting behind the veil. The blood is the way through the curtain and into the intimacy. Would you agree? Any other way to get through there? By the way, there's a whole section I've done before about the fact that the veil was torn top to bottom and we spent a good part of our lives trying to stitch it back together again. Because we feel safer on this side of the veil. Because going back there, it isn't safe, but it is very good. Not safe to be that vulnerable with anybody, but when you can fully trust them, it's very good. It's not, though, so we simply can hang out. We have work to do. We have words to proclaim. We have intercession to make. But will we draw near through the veil or remain in the courtyard? That is always a question when we come to the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Okay? Now, I will tell you this, too. In Orthodox, well, in most Jewish congregations, right, they will make sure that they are reconciled and asking for forgiveness from those they feel who may have offended because you can't ask forgiveness for God if you haven't asked forgiveness from others and given it. So it's always a good time. Keep short accounts. You tracking? So, how many of you had a storm pass through your life recently? <laughs> Some of you still are, still in it. It's going to be a while for cleanup on this one. It's amazing, though. Once you get back on the grid, you, you, you still live in this delight of the, of the simple things like hot showers. Okay? In fact, last night, woke up at 12.15 because the power had gone out. Oh, did it happen on YouTube? Okay. And I thought, okay, and my brain's starting to go, okay, well, we have flight deck tomorrow night. Let's see. And so I'm starting to think through because last week, you know, we did that, and the generator got us through most of it. Some of you were a little too hot, and it, you know, overloaded. And so, anyway. But you just, it's its not bad to be separated from the grid for a time. Because then you remember, sometimes it's not bad to have a dark night of the soul, as St. John of the Cross talks about, because then you're refreshed and restored and renewed. So some questions. Have you been running on your own fuel and generator? See, a lot of times if we are disconnected from the grid because the blood has lost its power to us, to us, blood will never lose its power, but it loses its power to us. We go, oh, I can't do that again. I can't go back there again. You know, part of what I love is the fact that God is an amnesiac. After I confess my sins, I ask for forgiveness for all these my sins, Father, and I thank you and recognize that you have now removed them from me as far as the east is from the west, and you choose to remember them no more. Clean start. No wonder he can enjoy me. It's under the blood, and he's chosen to forget it. I'm the one who has a problem forgetting it. And God's like, well, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing? What's with the self-flagellation? Cut it out. Are we depending on the gift rather than on the grid? You know yourself. And you know what? This is where the body of Christ is going to shift, folks. This is where we have to shift more and more. We are going to have to be increasingly dependent on the full power of God to come through. 
I am absolutely 100% convinced that that storm last night was diminished from the power of the prayers of the saints. I have no question. I have no question. I man, I was I was in it and after it, I was part with other people that is being declared. Sandra sent me something from Jennifer Leclerc. I was on connecting with that. I mean, you got to go. Jesus stood up in the boat and spoke to the storm. And man, there was havoc, and I was just grieving because I was like, Lord, we're just barely getting through this one. And I had a friend down there who's decided to ride it out so he could minister to people. And Sandra's property is down there, and our friends Jerry and Joanna had property down there. I'm just like, Lord, come on. And even when I was awake at 12.15 for the power, I'm going, mercy, Lord, mercy, mercy. But we have got to get off of the gift, which is whatever self-generation we have, and get onto the grid. And here's the question. Can you hear the alarm sound? Okay. <laughs> See, sometimes the reality is, like the first time we went through this, I didn't have that in place. And we had to wait for somebody else to tell us, hey, your power's been restored. You know, if that hadn't happened, we would have just kept running the generator. In fact, on Monday at about 4 o'clock, I ran out to get the next gallons of, of you know, five-gallon containers. We were running about 12 gallons a day, 12 and a half of that. And I was next... Two got them filled up on Monday uh, late afternoon. And then Monday night, the alarm went off. Power's restored. Shut down those other stuff. Shut down that. But I got all this fuel, God. Really? Really? You, you want to keep it on there and just, just and deal with the noise and the constant feeding of the beast and everything, you know? Or do you want to just... But see, you have to just... You have to say, Lord, get my attention. Hit me with a two-by-four. Shout at me. Let me know. The power's back. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about when you've walked with the Lord and it's just been drudgery and suddenly you walk in and something. But see, it's not that hard. We don't have to stress and strain to give it. This is what I'm trying to get through to you. I did not run on that generator with the assumption that, you know, the power company arranged this storm. They knocked down all these trees so I wouldn't have power. They made this thing miserable. And you know what? They're probably not really working to get it restored. I'd be an idiot, right? Okay. Now, some of us, when we're not getting along with God, we run that kind of narrative. Okay, God, I guess I'm just a scum-sucking pig, and you really, you really should ignore me. And, you know, and just on and on. No, you, you don't get that God is sitting there going, I'm, it's being restored. It's being restored. Hang on there. We'd watch for the trucks. We'd talk to the linemen. We'd look with anticipation. There was expectation. When you are off the grid, folks, you've got to start looking with expectation. God, I'm waiting for it. I'm looking for it. How do I grab hold? What's my part? I'm listening for the alarm. Do you understand? And, folks, this is going to happen in a heartbeat. You're going to be in a situation where it's a faith moment. We are all going to be. It's a faith moment. And suddenly you're going to feel disconnected from the grid. Oh, crap. I can't say that. I can't do that. I look foolish. You've got to be going, okay, God, grid, grid. Where's, where's grid? Where's the power? It's by the blood, son. Connect in again by the blood. Connect by the blood. It's all by that. Okay. The power. And I'm going to have to step out in faith and grab hold of the grid. Do you understand? Some of you do, some not. Okay. So here's the other challenge. If I had flipped the big switch without disconnecting the generator, things would have gone very ugly. Like blowing up ugly, maybe? Okay. Part of the connection of getting lined with the grid is you've got to be willing to shut off your self-generator. Okay, God, I can't, I can't do this. I can't step through that. I can't walk through that. I can't do it on my power, but on yours I can. And then this big thing, will you flip the switch? And I'm just telling you, folks, I won't take you out there to do it because it would mess with the house wiring right now, but, but you moving that switch, it's major because the first time you do it, it scares the snot out of you because you're aware that big box is like this size, right? And I'm aware of what's in there. Because I did the wiring for putting in the other circuit breaker, so you pull off the other stuff. I know enough about electricity to not get dead and to follow code, okay? But let me tell you, I'm, I'm a bit nervous around it because I know what it can do. But you have to 
give that a shove. And I think they make this one so big and so hard to do. So again, so that you really know you're committed. And then we'll, do we grasp that the blood really connects? Connects deeply. And will we stay on the grid? And will the power flow through us to others? Because this is a time when we are going to have to be more and more interceding, standing in the gap, connecting people to what God has. And it, frankly, it will not be, for the most part, the institutional church, because the institutional church is seen in a certain way, that we have created an image that we have rightly deserved, mostly, of being self-absorbed, self-righteous, and everything else. But the individuals, you out there, Natalie out there is a light and a force to reckon with. And she'll walk through and ask anything. Right? And they don't have her painted as some Bible-thumping believer because she's not. She loves Jesus. Jason, another one. I mean, you would think he's either a bum or an alcoholic from looking at him. Yeah. <laughs> it makes it real easy to come up to him, right? And you know what? He's going to talk, and he's going to be glad, and he's going to be engaged and ask questions and friendly and everything else. And it's just like, and you have no idea that he's carrying 50 gigawatts of power of kingdom power, and that in a heartbeat, he'll loose it because he's another one. No fear. Right out there. Kind of like Peter. Just bleh, here you go. Going to be the first one out of the boat. We'll sink well, but we'll recover. See, intercession is part of how Jesus functions for us right now. There's a Hebrew and there's a Greek, but I like the Hebrew breakouts from the word more about intercession. It means to impinge by accident or violence, to come upon, entreat, fall upon, make intercession, intercessor, meet together, pray, reach. But that first one, the, the original core word of it is to strike. <laughs> it's a strike. We are going to be looked for interceding things far more than storms, folks. There's bigger fish to fry. Uh, there's a Monday night prayer call going on. I send that out. If you can get on that, do that, okay? It's state leaders across Georgia making pronouncements and declarations. It's warfare-oriented. We have this big election. Georgia has a huge role to play, okay? There are storms, political, natural, spiritual, all going on at the same time. I found this fascinating about the priority of prayer and intercession, that in Acts 6, when it comes up about the food not being evenly distributed, the disciples say, no, that's not good for us to get involved in. You need to pick some people to take care of that. And then they say this, for we will give ourselves continually to prayer to the ministry of the word. They understood how important those prayers were. Okay? We get that. We get the power of intercession how critical it is. And tonight, we want to just render honor to whom honor is due. Because, you know, we have the carrier model. And part of the carrier model is we don't own you. <laughs> and we don't control you. You belong to a higher authority. And when you come and you're assigned here for a while, you bring your gifts and abilities, and, and we give things and encourage and strengthen you. But then when it's time for you to shift, we want to bless you. Okay? We want to encourage you. And Martha and Patricia have been two key members of the intercession team for years now, going back. I mean, when did we do the Lowndes High School cleanup? How many years ago was that? Goodness. At least seven or eight, you know. So part of the teams to go do that, major, major breaking things down and, and doing that. And they've been part of the group of the Magnificent Seven intercessors. And God is shifting things around, okay? And Patricia, what I want to honor, Patricia Patricia has another assignment that's here in town. But God's made it very clear she needs to go do that. And at first, I don't think she was going to necessarily come by, but it's like, I want to honor that. Because, see, that's when we ask you, make sure you're still supposed to be here, okay? We love you. We don't necessarily need need or want to see you. Well, most of you, we don't need or want to see you go. But 
But we, we want, we simply want you to honor where God has put you. Martha at times, and Martha was here, and then Martha felt like, no, she wasn't supposed to be, and then she came back again. It's like, okay, we're good. Martha's got an assignment that's now back up in West Virginia, okay? Virginia Beast, sorry. not. And so she's following that too. So we wanted to just get a chance to render honor to these two women. And then I want to also say there's another shift around it's going because, you know, Scotty's got her, her sh- there's a shift in her physical location that's going to be in process now. We don't know how long that's going to happen. Everybody okay down in Florida? I didn't hear. Your family? Okay. Yeah, we were praying for them too. And so Jeannie Webb is going to come along and they're going to co-lead this so that when Scotty does move down there, then Jeannie will come into the primary position with that. So we're in a time of shifting. Okay? Shifting. And that's a good thing. It's not an easy thing, but it's a good thing, right? Remember, the thing we went through in the 11 days without being off the grid gave us a whole other appreciation for things we were just taking for granted. When those things come, it gives you an appreciation. You reshift, and then you make sure you're plugged into the right grid. And that's part of what's happened.